slow trains to Istanbul. If you've ever dreamt of dropping everything and adventuring cross-country to the edge of Asia, well, that's just what rail enthusiast Tom Cheshire did, hitting the tracks for a 4,570-mile adventure on 55 rides, shadowing the old Orient Express route. Delighted to say that I'm joined by Tom this morning. Tom, good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you for having me on. Pleasure is all mine. There are there is no more famous train route, is there, than the Orient Express? It just it just brings to mind the sort of the, the glamour of European train travel from a from a previous age. Um, what was it that made What was it made that made you want to sort of walk in those footsteps uh, and and hit the tracks, as it were? Well, it, it, uh, the, just the name is so evocative, the, the Orient Express, as, you, as you're mentioning there. And I'd all, always wondered, you know, what it would be like to do it. And having been on the Trans-Siberian uh, Express across Russia and been on a, a train across America and, a, or, or, uh, and even a train across Australia for different travel books, I was like, why haven't I done the wonderful journey that's on my doorstep, really? From And you, you, I could leave from London, get to Paris, and then head off and this is the route that um that was established actually in 1883 so it was uh, by a man called george nagelmackers who was a kind of elgin entrepreneur engineer who'd gone to america and seen how the the, the man over there pullman had been uh, george mortimer pullman had been developing the plush trains in america and going across america and and, and so i just i want i, I was so uh, in, the, the idea was so evocative to set off as they did in 1883, heading towards the uh, 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 towards Istanbul. And and these days the, there is no direct actual direct train mm. apart from one service. That so every year there's the Venice Simplon Orient Express. Yeah. But this one service that runs at the end of August is uh, at the price. Can you guess what the price is for this one one way journey? Oh well, I, 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 I'm on the press list for them, so I get the occasional one. So, so, but I, and I, I'm always afraid of opening the email because it, it might have been charged me for that one. It's, it's eye-wateringly expensive, isn't it? This one journey per person, if you want to go directly from Paris to Istanbul, is seventeen thousand five hundred pounds per person. But obviously, it's a kind of an, you know, in the original old carriages, they, uh, and and beautiful. You yeah. know, service and many people, you know, very wealthy rail enthusiasts from from around the world will do this, but uh, we didn't quite. I didn't quite have the, that budget, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> so I set off from um, Gardella Est as Nagel Nackers did all that time ago. With and can I just say before yeah. we get any further, that's a yeah. wonderful surname, and I was hoping you would say that again, Nagel Nackers. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that, those those are sort of names that we don't have anymore for a very good reason, I should imagine. <laughs> But he was a he was a key figure actually because because he was the son of a, a Belgian banker and he was very wealthy and and in order to get the route to go all the way to Istanbul he needed to have connections with the kind of royal families of the different countries along the way right and because his father was such a wealthy man and could actually provide loans for different people different you know he was a figure in Europe um, permission was easier and so he managed to link up this this. Uh, Route and he'd also because he'd been to America to see what Pullman was doing in America. He kind of tr- bettered what was going on in terms of the actual quality of the carriages, and so he was this kind of key guy. And so the carriages had the, uh, the, with trains underneath carriages. There are bogies. If you, do you yes. know about that? You know all the, the bogies. And so he pr- introduced bogies to the so they have a smoother ride on these luxury carriages that went. From Paris to Istanbul, and and in fact, the the first journey, um, so it went via Strasbourg, it went on to Vienna, then to Budapest, and on onwards to uh, Romania. But then, when it got to Romania, it got as far as the uh, river, uh, the, the Danube, um, at a place called Gugu, <laughs> which I've never heard of before. This, right. this writing this book, and they had to get a ferry across the Danube. A little train to the Black Sea, and then they took a ferry all the way from Varna on the Black Sea all the way to Istanbul. So the very first uh, Orient Express was actually a lot of it was on 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 the, the ferry at the end. Um, 
but over the years then the the the, the link the the trains got better and nagel knackers was was key was key in, uh, to to all of this and and then really then then the so by the kind of turn of the 20th century um the the trains were kind of direct all the way to Istanbul and then the golden era that you were referring to kind of mm-hmm. really kicked in up to kind of the second world war and just after um and and then after the second world war of course jet planes came in and people even people like Agatha Christie who had been taking the trains regularly um decided it actually was easier to fly um and so then the 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 the, the, the popularity of the orient express began to wane and then by 1977 it was in kind of really in a, a very poor state and it was not the glamour days of of the of the pre-war period mm. and it was actually just uh, very simple couchettes with um, not even a dining carriage on the train and the, the great travel writer Paul Theroux I think he was on the very one of the last the either the year it ended or the year before and he said um, his 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 if he go humorous quote was it's murder on the orient express <laughs> <laughs> like cuz he was used to better standards you know yeah. travel himself yeah but it, anyway um yeah it's it's interesting isn't it because here's the thing we've we've come full circle on this one because the jet jet travel was glamorous in the 50s 60s and 70s it was a thing that you know you people used to get dressed up to go for jet travel and now it's now it's obviously in, in the world of a budget airline etc it's not it's just like getting on and off bus and since since the you know that that thing of which we cannot refer to that ends with pandemic uh, came along. We, we, a lot of people have been reappraising stuff and want to be more eco friendly and want to take their time. And we've had a slow food movement and we, we're having a slow travel movement. And so there is no better way of appreciating a country and unwinding than on a train. I, I, I totally I'm getting I'm getting that completely. And I, I think the the low cost airline. Boom! Everyone was so excited when, in the nineties, mid to late nineties, it happened, and you could fly off to places you couldn't pronounce or spell in Eastern Europe for one pence plus tax or whatever. Yeah. And and then and there was a kind of the trains really got put to the uh, in the uh, side, you know, into the sidings for a while. And um, the uh, uh, but you're you're right. I think people now the kind of the cattle herding of of people onto low cost carriers and that 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 initial glamour of the low cost airlines if that's not uh, if that's the right way of putting it or the excitement of it has has uh, gone away and, and and people are more uh, greener in in their, the way they think about travel and you know in Spain uh, you've got the brilliant high speed links between the different cities and i think the, the spanish government has even uh, announced that there shouldn't be planes um where you can take a train for a two-hour journey or two i think that's official policy which is actually the same policy in france mm, which is and which, then, which raises a few eyebrows because the current prime minister pedro sanchez has an all has a, a certain fondness for his private jet but there you go <laughs> <laughs> well who's a, p- a p- politician being hypocritical? Exactly. <laughs> who, who is, but there is, I mean, th- th- you can now travel due to high-speed rail links and whatever else from, say, from, I could get on a train and out, you know, the nearest big train station to me, Malaga or Algeciras, and I could go, to, I can go literally direct via Barcelona or whatever to to to, to Paris or whatever. I mean, it's, it's absolutely w- wonderful. And you, you get, to, it's the undiscovered, it's it's the, but it's the side route, isn't it? It's, it's the, it's the little stations. I mean, getting on a, getting on a fast train is all well and good but you know yeah. I've, I've taken trains through spain and you know the old style talgos and stuff like that and there are you see you see things and you and, and places and stations and the most bizarre situation there's bizarre uh, places and also yeah. these almost surreal visions out of the window yeah well i mean I, I, the, the uh, this this book is called slow trains to istanbul but the previous book I wrote was called Slow Trains Around Spain, which uh, w- w- covered the kind of loc- the, the small local lines, the regional lines, and it went to places like Badajoz and on the way to uh, Cuenca, kind of went across the middle of Spain to Valencia. From, and then I stopped at a place, I remember stopping at a little town called Almaden, um, which was a, um, 
uh, where mercury was mined, uh, the the um, ore that from which mercury ca- came, and it was such a I got off at the at the, the station, and there was a, a cat on a on a on a bench um, with a bowl of milk, by it. <laughs> and there was nobody else. There was nobody else, just the cat, and and then it was a kind of stroll, uh, you know, a couple about a mile into town, and then. It were kind of it was the people were confused that a tourist had turned up, um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, but so that, so I've had that great fantastic experience in Spain. But on on this particular book, yeah. uh, um, it was uh, it was the joy. And in fact, fact for the first half of it, I travelled with an old journalism colleague colleague or friend I'd been to journalism college with, and and it was a bit not three men in a boat. It was two men on a load of trains and so there's a bit of a kind of a kind of dialogue between us becomes part of the of the experience of the book for the, the first half on the way to Istanbul and we we stopped in places that we hadn't expected to stop at we stopped at a town called Passau um, which is where the Danube where three rivers meet in Germany right by the border of of Austria and it was not not somewhere that many people go to um, and it we ended up, it was a Monday night when we were there, and we ended up going to a karaoke evening in an Irish bar, <laughs> which, which was quite, you know, and then uh, having a look around this very quiet, that was the kind of the only place that seemed to be open on that particular evening, having a look around and l- learning about the history of that town, which actually turned out to be a key key place in the region because it was where these three rivers met but mm. n- nobody had ever heard of it particularly or i'm sure people have but i hadn't heard of it and then the we went on rather than stay in vienna we went to bratislava which is very interesting because of the kind of communist era architecture on the on the suburbs which is quite grim and austere but there was a lovely old town um which kind of was hidden away um and and had uh, lots of history and interesting old markets and, 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 and lovely old basement bars with serving kind of goulash and things like that. Uh, so we, and then, uh, then, then, then on the, on the, when we got to Bulgaria, we stopped in a town called Rus, Ruse, R-U-S-E. And that really was kind of off the beaten track. And I think we must've been the only tourists in, in the, in the, in the whole city from, you know, and we'd stopped, stopped off on the train there. Most, you do get people, on the trains who are going, who are on the kind of tr- the way to Istanbul, but nobody actually got off at Rusay apart from us. Mm. And we then looked around and kind of had a, had a, a restaurant to ourselves, a kind of just us and a couple of locals who were kind of staring into their pints. Um, and, um, and then they had that, that was where the National Rail Museum of Bulgaria, the National Transport Museum of Bulgaria happened to be. Which not not many is not on the, the the kind of must visit list of of Europe. Which is strange, really, <laughs> when you consider the, the the massive strides and the input that Bulgaria had into the automotive and, and transport industries worldwide. Yes, yes. Well, <laughs> maybe it should be uh, you know better, better, but you know it should be flagged up. And, you know, but the uh, um, but the whole so that so the train journey so that uh, so on this in for this book i went all the way to istanbul following the old route yeah then my old pal flew back to the uk because his teenagers needed to be looked after and uh, he couldn't take a whole month off and then i, I returned by um on separately uh, i went from istanbul to sofia and then down to the border with greece right um where the trains actually completely ran out and then for the first time in my life i had to hitchhike and put a uh, there was no bus no no train um so i had I, I was given a lift by a bulgarian uh lorry driver for um uh sort of 100 miles or so down into thessaloniki which is the second city of uh, greece and then from thessaloniki i took a um train there'd been a terrible tr- uh, train crash i don't know if you'd heard about it um so two Februarys ago, there was a, a head-on collision in Greece mm. with um, two bus trains where 57 people, around 60 people died. And Greece was only just getting back on track in terms of its trains. And so it was uh, only, they'd only been running for two weeks. And, uh, by the 
uh, only been back up and running because um, of public lack of confidence in the trains. Um, and so it was very interesting going around Greece on trains when none, none of the very few Greeks were actually taking them. So all the trains were, were empty, really, at that, for that period. I think the confidence has obviously come back since then. Um, and then I got to, from, through Greece, got to a place called Patras via um, Athens. And then the in, the interrail passes, which uh, I, I had an interrail pass, you could then get a ferry from Patras across to Italy, to Bari. Yes. There was a choice of either the going to Brindisi or to Bari. And then it was a joy in Italy. I went across to Naples, and I loved, loved Naples. I was there when the local football team was playing a, a European uh, Champions League uh, game but uh, and so the whole town was nuts for football and, uh, and Maradona posters everywhere and banners and uh, and, and, and and Naples was absolutely football crazy then went all the way up through Italy to a place called Tirano on the border with Switzerland and that's another would be like you're talking about small places tiny little town that most people would normally go through, but I stayed the night there and it's got the mountains rising all around and it was a lovely, quiet, quiet spot. And then from there, you get the train into a place called Chur, C-H-U-R, and then that's in Switzerland. And that's one that on the Bernina Express, the, the train is called. And then from Chur, you get the Glacier Express across to Zermatt. Um, and again, this is a scenery that every rail enthusiast or lover must must someday sample yeah. and then from because of the, it's just a kind of iconic wonderful journey and then and then from there kind of weaved up through france to luxembourg um and then into belgium um and i went to waterloo so uh, to the actual so i went to the real waterloo station not not, not the one the, in london yes exactly yeah <laughs> And, and then, yeah, go on. Here's the thing. What, did, did, you, you were interrailing, so presumably that keeps the cost down, because if you, if you look at sort of, if you just Google going from, I don't know, London to, say, say Bari or wherever you wanted to go, or, or, or which, yeah. the, the, the costs would probably seem prohibitive. I know that sort of, uh, you know, my, one of my goddaughters tried to get back via rail because she couldn't fly from sort of Malaga to, to, to London, and it was, it was ridiculous. So is, is the trick to get an interrail pass or to do the research and, and, and get not, de- not take the high speed if, you, if you've got the time to sort of dawdle along the way? Well, the, the, the trick definitely for this type of trip that I did was to get the interrail pass. And, that, and, the, and the great thing about that is the right to hone in on that. And so, so the, and the great thing is that the, these were originally brought in, I think it was around 1972. And it was, uh, so they've just had their 50th anniversary, I believe. But wow. they, the, the, so they've, um, so the, these, these tickets have, um, I'm just looking at the price here. So a 15 day pass, like, so, uh, so you can travel for 15, 15 days continuously. Yeah. That's £410. Or if you're over 60, it's £368. Or if you're under 28, it's £307. <laughs> but that gives you... So you're looking at 40 less... Well, what's 15? 410 divided by 15, it's not a huge amount per day. Yeah. But that gives you the freedom of the tracks. Um, and um, it's a it's a great kind of tradition. Uh, um, and then these interrail pa- the way it works is these days. So when I did it, I've done this once before about seven or eight years ago. But you had a paper pass then, and now they've got these a very nifty app sure. which you you just click on, and it, it's so. I mean, initially, it was a little bamboozling, but you know, after a couple of goes of doing it, it was simple. And and the, uh, Mark Smith, the man at seat sixty one. Um, do you know that website? I've heard about. Yes, I've heard that one. Yeah, he, he's a great. Uh, he's he's great for advice. If any of the listeners are interested in the, the nuts and bolts of arranging a trip by Interrail, look at look up his website. I think it's called seat sixty one dot com. And and then and 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 he he's a he says uh, these the, these uh, apps are simple. And I kind of just trusted his voice his opinion and then and, and they were so once you once you get used to it and and then you've got in your pocket you've got a free ticket effectively well you paid for it but you've got a ticket to 
as long as you say what your journey is and you show it and you're given a QR code and then you show that QR code to the ticket inspector, scans it, gives you the thumbs up and, and you're, you're fine. And as some of the routes required additional, um, some routes have a kind of a little tick against, oh, X against them and you must pay, say, 10 euros extra to reserve a seat, right. which is a bit annoying, but it, it, it's, okay, it's okay, it's easy to do as well. Um, and that, um, but but the whole the whole, I mean, really, this is this. We're going back to what you're talking about, like yeah. the kind of trains versus planes. This train, I think, there will be a train era of tra- travel around Europe because the, the the trains are getting so much better. You, you know, in Spain with the high speed trains, uh. that uh, across Europe the trains are improving, and and uh, and, and and also sleeper trains. So they kind of. Sleeper services uh, are, 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 are incredibly kind of. They, 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 Austria is leading the way. They have a train called the Night Jet train, right. um, and they, these Night Jets are, are linking up lots of Central Europe and going to Paris. Uh, I don't know what it's like in Spain uh, uh, with the. Do you, do you have sleepers? Yeah, there are sleepers that go from from. I mean, I used to, you go from Barcelona to Algeciras, but it stops at a place called Bobadilla, which is is the equivalent of, of Clapham Junction, if you will. But the thing is, it's in the middle of <laughs> it is in the middle of nowhere, and it's got a very low platform, uh, and it's surrounded by nothingness apart from some abandoned, some, some abandoned, very pretty ceramic factories. And I used to get the train in the morning, and at the same time, the the sleeper came through, and people would get off and start panicking, thinking they got got to the wrong place which is which is one of the one of the great things about uh, about rail travel isn't it that people get off and go are we are you sure we're here <laughs> <laughs> i think i went when i was going around i did go to bobadia yeah. on the uh, it had one cafe that's and, the one <laughs> and a roundabout from what i remember everywhere yeah. in space got a roundabout these days what um, I, I could I, I think i'm about to run out of time but what i was going to say is there okay. one of the things i love about train travel is when you pull into a strange city because you get this wonderful view that you don't get when you come in by air because you get to see the back of people's gardens and 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 you get all snapshots of life what's yeah. it like pulling into istanbul by on a train Okay, so the, yeah, with you, you arrive over. I arrived over, overnight in the sleeper from Sofia, and we got in. Um, and the kind of dawn, uh, it, it was into a kind of a, a tower block suburb, to tell the truth. Um, and it's, I think, it's called Halkili or something. It's a particular station, and then you get another train, a com- commuter train, that ends up underneath the Bos- underneath the Bosphorus in a, a, a station that, and you can't. So you, your initial arrival, you can't see a thing because you're in a tunnel underneath. Mm. However, you come up from that tunnel out into a place called Serketchi Station. And Serketchi Station is where the old, they've got the Orient Express restaurant. They've got these kind of Oriental style, um, beautiful arches and um, stained glass windows and a really old style, this old style restaurant with white tablecloths and uh, uh, waiters with bow ties, and it's as though nothing's changed since 1883 or whatever. And 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 so that is the real treat. So when you finish, when you arrive in in Istanbul and you come out of the you get the, the rather disappointing commuter train through the suburbs into uh, and you arrive at Sokechi, you then have this amazing treat where you get all the of the atmosphere of the old days of the glory days comes rushing back to you um in this old station where it is hard it's kind of part used the station now um they've kept it how it was um and i think they're intending to run more trains from it in the future but so when i talk about the arrival in istanbul this is a, a massive highlight and you've got the phosphorus glimmering on to one side with and the bridges over it and guys fishing off the edge of the bridge and the trams rumbling by and you've got the lovely old uh, you sit there and have a, a well-deserved um, glass of vino uh, or whatever you choose to have um and it's uh, um just a, a treat that, that that's that's your prize for having made a long journey and on all the different trains you don't get that waiting for the red eye from Stansted, do you let's face it <laughs> no, 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 not 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 on um, easy jet to Malaga or whatever. <laughs> Indeed, um, I'm going to run out of time, Tom. But uh, the book is called "The Slow Train to Istanbul." It's by Tom Cheshire. Tom, what do you hope that people take from the book? 
What, sorry? What do you hope that people take? I mean, is it, don't get, you know, the, let the, I mean, as the saying used to go, is it a case of, go on, let the train take the strain? What do you hope that people will, t- will discover? Well, the, the thing is that y- Europe um, is a wonderful place and it's waiting to, to be with the history and cultures and it's waiting to be visited down the line. You can do that cheaply. You can easily uh, travel the hotels and so forth. But the, I'd say the message overall, like I, the book is to have a message, is... A lot of the time we, we sit around looking at phones and having kind of virtual experiences these mm. days. But what, to go and see, hear, smell, touch, uh, listen, and, 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 and taste the different foods, to see with your own senses Europe and, and to do it in this easy way, really, um, is, a, is a kind of something that we shouldn't take for granted, I don't think. And, you know, when with AI threatening to take over the world, um, what, why, what, you know, we've got uh, these, this, this way of travel um, is something to be cherished, I think. The book is called Slow Trains to Istanbul and Back, a 4,570-mile adventure on 55 rides. It's by Tom Cheshire. Tom, I'm going to write a time. Thank you so much for your time today. <laughs> no, thank you.